Hello everyone. Have we got an exciting evening plan for you? Creative dialogues are simply that, conversations between two leading creative people from any area of arts and media. Tonight, we've got a double bill, two guests and two interviewers who are all at the top of their fields. I'm Janice Kay, University of Exeter Provost, and it's an incredible honour for me to introduce our guests, Mira Sayal and Sanjeev Basker, in conversation with Professor Linda Williams and Mark Kamade. I can't tell you how long I've been looking forward to this. Mira Sayal is a multi-award winning actor, comedian and writer with numerous television, theatre and film credits. These include Beautiful Thing, Absolutely Anything, Doctor Strange and Paddington 2. The Royal Shakespeare Company's Much Ado About Nothing, David Hare's Behind the Beautiful Forevers and Kenneth Branagh's production of Romeo and Juliet. Her first novel, Anita and Me, is on the national curriculum and she has several other critically acclaimed novels. She wrote the screenplays for the wonderful films Bargy on the Beach and My Sister Wife and who will ever forget the groundbreaking comedy series Goodness Gracious Me and The Kumars at number 42. In 2015, she was awarded the CBE for Services to Drama and Literature. And in 2017, she was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Sanjeev Basker is a multi award winning actor, writer, and presenter, coming to prominence <laughs> like Laura in Goodness Gracious Me. I'm going to go through this, guys. And the QMARS at number 42. QMARS won a BAFTA nomination, two Emmy Awards a Bronze Rose of Montreux Award and a Brit Comedy Award. In 2007, Sanjeev embarked on a highly personal journey through modern India with the BBC to commemorate 60 years of Indian independence. His accompanying travel book became a Sunday Times bestseller. His acting roles include the lead as Dr Prem Sharma in the BAFTA Award winning te television series The India Doctor and as D.I. Sunny Khan in Unforgotten, surely one of everyone's favourite characters. Mira and Sanjeev will be in conversation with Linda Williams and Mark Kermode. Linda is a professor of film in the Department of English and Film at the University. She's written and edited several books and teaches British and American cinema with a focus on gender and the contemporary creative sector. Linda's groundbreaking Calling the Shots research examines what is distinctive about the work of women in British cinema and what obstacles face women in the industry. Mark Commode, self-declared as outspoken, opinionated and never lost for words, is chief film critic for The Observer and does the BBC News Channel Film Review. He hosts his own podcast Commode on Film and has a movie soundtrack show on Scala Radio. He co-hosts Commode and Mayo's film review on BBC Five, Radio 5 Live, presents Mark Commode's Secrets of Cinema on BBC Two, Ooh. and has a monthly live show at the BFI South Bank, Mark Commode Live in 3D. We're delighted and very proud to say that he also holds, holds the position of Mark Commode Honorary Professor of Film at Exeter. Mark, this is the second time you've hosted Creative Dialogues. Next time, we will be interviewing you. So, <laughs> Mira, Sanjeev, Linda, Mark, simply, you are inspirational. Thank you for taking the time from your schedules to share your experience and wisdom with us. And finally, before handing over, I do have a few quick points of housekeeping. We're recording tonight's event and it will be available on the, on the Creative Dialogues website. Because of large numbers, we can't show you all on camera and we will need to mute your mics to avoid feedback. But we're very keen for your questions. Please post them in the Q&A Q chat section that you will find near the bottom of your screen. We'll do our best to get through as many questions as possible. So now, without further ado, it's over to you all. Thank you so much, Janice. That that was you know, that was that was that was wonderful, and um, absolutely reflects you know how honoured we feel having Sanjeev and Mira here. We're just delighted to to have you here. So thank you for saying yes to us. Um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, also slightly surreal that it's the two of us in different rooms in one house <laughs> and the two of you in different spaces in your house um, <laughs> piling in together. But um, there we go. I think this might be my idea. So I take full responsibility, but we'll 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 give it a go, shall we? Um, Mark, do you want do you want to start us off? I'd like to start by apologising for the fact that my room appears to be absolutely <laughs> <laughs> full of kibble and clutter and i'd like to say that that's because i do keep sent... telling you look how many yeah. is down here mark i know i know look at that's a terrible thing also uh you know sanjeev is apparently out in the garden room i am the, in the, the garden room yes the new well, garden studio how it, is it sanj it it's it's it, well well you can see by the pictures it's like i'm in a bunker really <laughs> which is not what we had in mind when you and, and not the picture you get when you were when the words garden and rumour together <laughs> either. So this is actually, this is the first time we've used it. So it's, there are teething problems, um, but it feels very strange to be um, banished to the bottom of the garden. But look, like a bad dog. <laughs> He's Let not allowed begin... on the couch either. <laughs> Let me begin by banishing that image from my head and saying uh, with both of you, you know, you've managed to <clears throat> conquer stage screen big screen small screen literature and obviously you know i know sans at the moment you're in a in a house in the garden but for most of the time i presume you're in the same space do you create stuff together or separately do you have different areas in which you work or do you discuss stuff in the living room how does it work creatively with the two of you <laughs> Go on, Mira. <laughs> you go first, because then anything that I say will just sound defensive. So. No, well, we, well, to be honest, we don't really write anything together. Um, we've certainly acted together a, a couple of times since we've been married, obviously a lot before we were married, and that's always joyous. But our approach, our approach to writing is so different that the couple of times we've tried, best not, really. Um but we are hugely appreciative of each other's work. And we do naturally do a lot of discussing of what we're doing, script editing, batting ideas about, but it's always in a casual sort of, we meet in the kitchen for a cup of tea and they go, I'm really stuck on this or what do you think of this? So it's never sort of flagged up as, hey, will you help me with my script? Um, it seems to be quite organic because we both have a study each, which I think is essential really. I, I, you know, I just like Virginia Woolf says, you've got to have a room of your own. Um, and I think we both feel that. Um, so I think we're very supportive of each other's work, but we have found out we don't, we don't, we shouldn't write together. Well, it's either write together or live together. So it was kind yeah. of, it was a start, we chose that one. Choice. But also I think the way that um, we approach writing is very different. Mira is incredibly organised. She's very, very disciplined. So she's one of those people who, if she's got other things to do, you know, and she only knows she's got two hours, she will kind of say, I'm going to be writing for two hours. And uh, I'm the person who wanders around waiting for the muse to call. And so the way I've always kind of written and approached ideas has been very piecemeal. So, you know, I might write for 10 minutes and then watch, you know, uh, the beginning of a favourite film and then what, write for half an hour and then play a song on the guitar or something. And it's so my ideas come from that sort of maelstrom. And accordingly and unsurprisingly, Mira's room and study is incredibly organised, whereas mine looks it's 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 like a kind of uh, um, it's like it's been planned that if any robbers get in, they'll just look at it and go, we're too late. Someone <laughs> got here before us. Um, so that kind of mess is is something I think which is a good indication of my head, certainly, and, and probably a good indication of Mira's as well in terms of where the creative ideas come from I yeah. think mine come from lots of conflicting kind of ideas and images yeah so I so sorry Mira go on no I was saying I always seem to catch him in the bits where he is watching a film or playing his guitar and I go what have you, have you done anything <laughs> I'm thinking um but actually I'm very envious of the fact that I'm, I'm a bit of a plodder you know I, I get things done but I don't always think they're brilliant whereas Sanj is one of those annoying people that will sort of shilly shally around and then come up with three genius ideas that it would have taken me years to come up with and he seems to do it because he's you know that's the way his brain works so I totally respect that his brain works in a completely different way I'm a little envious of it actually 
So in terms of, I've got lots of questions about that really, that the, in, in terms of the other collaborations that you've done, like performing together, how, I mean, how does that work? Are you, how do you talk about that? How do you prepare for that? How do you sort of think your way towards doing that if you're quite separate in, in terms of the writing that you do? It's interesting. So when um, I came up with the idea for the Kumars at number 42, um, I asked Mira if she would play the granny and Mira basically said no. She said, why would I want to dress up as this old lady? And I said, because it requires a lot of improv and I can't think of anyone else who would be as good at being able to take the basis of a script and kind of occupy the character well enough to be able to go on these tangents. And so in a way that improv side of Mira's head, um, I think is very similar to mine. And so I think in the performance space, I think there's a difference, I think, in terms of how, I mean, Mira is probably a best uh, place to answer this, but I think Mira approaches it slightly different in performance. Is that right, Mira, or is, am I wrong again? Different, <laughs> different to what? I did silly. I didn't quite understand. Yeah, didn't listen to me. Um, just wanted to point that out. Um, in in the way that you write, you write very methodically and you're very focused. Yeah. Whereas when you're particularly with comedy, and I've seen you do it with drama as well, that um, the once you've got hold of the character, you can go off and fly at, at tangents and and improv. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's the key, though. It's like jazz, you know, you can't riff unless you know the melody. And I think it's really the same with, with impro that you've got to do your homework and know the character. I mean, we did all of those. Um, we did weeks and weeks of work on the characters of the Kumars, for example, uh, sort of hot seating. It's very much the way that Mike Lee works, I think, where you just know your character inside out. And then once you've done that groundwork, and that's a discipline bit, then you can impro because there's no curveball anyone can throw. You know your character. And we we had to be that prepared in the Kumars because, of course, we didn't know what the, what the guests were going to throw back at us at all. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I... I I think you're right. I mean, I think I feel much freer acting than I, than I do writing. But I'm, I'm, it's a shame that we don't get to impro more. I think we don't get enough of a chance as British actors to hone that particular muscle. And I think it's a really important one because it frees something in you. When you learn to jump without a net, it's, um, it's very good for your creative brain. Do you find at all that when you're, if you're working together on a, on a project, that it becomes indistinguishable. I'll, here's the specific question. I was on stage with Himesh Patel and I was asking him about that scene in Yesterday, which is a, a marvellous scene in Yesterday in which you are both in the scene together. And I said, I love that film. And I, I just, I love the way in which the humour of that gag plays out, which is that he is about to play them Yesterday, one of the greatest songs ever written. And they just think that their son is about to play some song that he's knocked up. <laughs> Let it and be, I by said, the way. And I said, um, yeah, that's, I beg your pardon. And I said, uh, I kept saying yesterday, because the name of the film is yesterday, but it's let it be, which is actually the whole point of the gag. So thanks, Sanji, for putting me right on that. <laughs> and so subtly as well. Anyway, so Himesh Patel <laughs> said, I said, is it funny doing it? Because he's not back yet. I said, is it funny doing it with all those lines? He said, well, you have to remember that one of the things about it is that some of the funniest lines aren't in the script. So the reason they're funny is because they're improv on set. He said, like, for example, it was Mira who came up with Leave Him Be. And then I tweeted this and Sanjeev immediately tweeted, I came up with Leave Him Be. Mm -hmm. Does that, does it happen a lot that there is like a sort of osmosis of who's like, and I say this incidentally as somebody who regularly steals and repeats things that Linda has <laughs> said and passes them <laughs> off as my own. Yeah. Um. No, what, what interested me was the speed at which Sanjeev <laughs> jumped on Twitter to, to put you right on that point. Oh, that's um, nothing. I, I, I actually emailed Danny Boyle to tell him to stop saying that Mira came up with it <laughs> in order to kind of straighten out the story. Now, I, I'm very happy that Mira did the line and did it so well in the film and better than I could have delivered it. However, that's not the same thing as coming up with. I came up with it in the audition, actually. And um, I came up with uh, Leave It Be. 
and Leave Him Be. I did both of those in, in my audition. And uh, then when we were on set, one of the things that working with Mira is, uh, which is a joy actually, is knowing that, um, you know, if I throw something out there that, you know, she'll absolutely pick up on it. So when it wasn't in the script, but when I turned around to Mira and said, what's it called? Mira just kind of came up with the, you know, repeated the line. And it just reminds me, and I, I say this because I, I take great joy uh, from this moment. There was a bit in the Kumars where I think we were interviewing Jane Seymour. And I said to Jane Seymour, uh, you're looking lovely tonight. And she said, oh, thank you very much. And I said, your turn. And she <laughs> said, you're looking lovely tonight. And I said, thank you. And none of this was scripted. And I said, um, pinstripes. I said, uh, because they're slimming. And I just threw it out there. And Mira came back with, you know, those stripes were a lot closer together before he put those on. <laughs> <laughs> Which is <laughs> it's a fantastic line. It's a fantastic line. So for me, when I know that there's somebody, that, whenever you're working with somebody that you know is going to pick up on those little things mm. and could make something of it, it's incredibly freeing. Yeah, and you you get that connection when you know someone really, really well. I mean, so to, so, you know, go right back to the first question you asked about working together. I mean, that is the huge advantage with something like improvisation is that because you do have that shorthand and uh, that happened a lot in the commands. I knew when he was setting something up, he knew when I was setting something up and we could just sort of bat it around a bit. And that was that's so joyful. You can't, that's lightning in a bottle. You can't really, you know, you can't recreate it just happens and I, so, yeah, it was so great. that that relationship and that sort of dynamism between the two of you that was already um sort of part of you working on together on goodness gracious me and obviously with the kumars but obviously you've got you've got married to each other as well so it's a it's a sort of working relationship that's that's that started in in one context but has it continued you know in another context is this how you are I, well, I'm completely faking everything at the moment. I mean, here is being completely honest and true. Uh, as usual, I think so. I think so. I think that, you know, one of the the lovely things uh, about getting older is that if you can sort of get some sort of handle on who you are uh, and be open about your own flaws and foibles and, you know, what needs work, um, you just relax a bit because you, you can then just kind of fall back on who you are. And... And I think in that sense, you know, the humour particularly, which, by the way, is essential because it gives you instant perspective. It's the one thing that people mm -hmm. forget that irony um, gives you uh, uh, an alternative view of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think for, for, for both of us, I think, you know, that's been an incredibly stabilising element and something as a core that runs through the family. So it becomes something that you can all connect with. So mm. it's it's much more difficult, not that would one, one, one would want to, to be precious about yourself because there's always somebody else there who will provide that much needed perspective. Mm. Mira, can I ask something about, in the case of, for example, writing a film like, you know, Bargy on the Beach, which is then directed by somebody else who has a very strong vision and a very strong personality, how does that work? Because obviously, you know, you're kind of 360 degrees creative, you know, you can act, you can write, you can. How does it feel handing your work to somebody else to some extent and seeing what they make of it? Do you find that easy or do you find it difficult? I think it depends on the person, actually. Um, I think some of the most fruitful collaborations come from writers working with directors, actually, because a good director will enhance your script and bring out things you didn't know were there and um, will be respectful of the cuts they have to make and that's inevitable I mean I think you have to understand as a screenwriter that it, you, know, you may think it's a finished product when you hand it over to, do our, to a director it's really not um, and then it becomes something else again when all the other departments get involved and then of course something amazingly different happens in the edit so you sort of accept that but if you share the same vision then as long as you get to the same vision it may not be what you wrote on the on the you know the draft you gave in and it probably won't be but as long as that's done respectfully then actually sometimes it can be an illuminating and incredible journey um, what's, what's the best experience you've had with that of handing your work to somebody and then finding things in it that you didn't think were there originally 
Oh my gosh. Well, I haven't written that many screenplays, so it's hard to say. Um, I would say, I would, I mean, I'd say Anitra me was a really great experience with Metin Hussain because um, it wasn't, it's, you know, it's quite hard to adapt something you're so close to. It was an autobiographical book and, um, you know, it's quite hard to see the wood for the trees. And then there were, as in all book adaptations, there were loads of bits of the book that weren't going to work for screen. And then you have to, you know, take out all those internal monologues and think, how the hell am I going to do that with pictures without using flashback narration, whatever. Um, but Metin Hussein, the director, found lots of sort of creative ways. And he really captured the spirit, actually, of, um, I mean, I, I watch the film now and I go, God, there's loads of things I could have done better. But the spirit of that little girl and that family really comes through so brilliantly and um we got the most amazing cast for it because i think everybody picked that up as well from the sort of authenticity and and um and joy of of the story so um that that was a great experience actually and we had a we had a great time she, well of course sandra was in it sandra was well you know he played my dad i played his grandmother it goes on <laughs> <laughs> Freud would have a field day. <laughs> Freud wouldn't need any other patients. <laughs> just, just me and you in, in the garden room. <laughs> so, so what, what was it like um, adapt? Um, are you using the same writerly muscles um, when you write the, the novel and then you adapt it as the screenplay? I mean, you, you're as you know, Mark's absolutely right you're such a polymath you're going from you know excelling in so many different areas but what's it like for you as a creative you write the novel the novel's really autobi autobiographical you then you know take it apart put it back together again and then it turns into something else that you're also involved in in different ways gosh writing prose is such a different experience it is is so private and um you know, the book world is so respectful, everyone's so nice and you get notes and you get things like, would you mind possibly looking at the length of chapter one? I mean, it's up to you. <laughs> it's just, and then you go to lovely festivals and everyone makes you cups of tea. And there's, I mean, I just love the whole book world. It's just, and then you get, you get into, you get into movies and it's like, <laughs> you know, not, not knives out exactly, but it's very different. It's very different. And everyone's got an opinion and everyone, you know, everyone has to justify the fact that they have a job with an opinion. So the most difficult part of screenwriting is that you somehow have to juggle 15 different sets of notes and stay true to your vision. And if you've got a great producer and director, they're all working with you for that same end. Um, but when you sit down with a blank screen for prose and you write, that's just you and your soul. That's just for you. Mm -hmm. um, and there'll be lots of rewrites after, but there's a purity in that experience. It is rather wonderful, mm -hmm. but it's lonely. I could never just be a book writer. It's so lonely. I mean, even when I was writing, whenever I wrote my novels, I would sort of do, do it in little two month chunks and then try and wedge in an acting job somewhere just so I could be around people, <laughs> be on a set and talk to people and work collaboratively because it's, um, yeah, I'm not quite made for the life of a just solely a writer. So the Obviously. moving between role to from role to role is is a kind of self-preservation or boredom or just you just need those different things in your life. From I mean your your different you know creative roles. Oh totally, but I think they all feed each other. I mean, for example, when I'm writing in a screenplay, I try and even make the smallest roles mean something because I've played those roles and I know how dispiriting it is to not even have a name you're just woman woman in office I try and give everyone a name but even if you've only got one scene to make it interesting um um and yeah I think they I think the disciplines feed each other constantly and also what, what do you write about if you don't live if you're not out there interacting with people all the best stories come from people you can sit on a bus and get an idea for three three novels just from conversations so just, I don't I think as a writer you you can be holed up and you're you know the more successful you get the bigger house you can get and the, the more you don't have to you know go on the bus anymore and that's that's when you lose all the stories actually so it's really important to be out and connected and, and living and, and listening I think and you get all of that on a set or in a theatre with a company of people as well. Are there any lines that that 
can't be crossed. And I ask this because, for example, Sand, you know, you've you've done all the stuff that you've done. You've also done you've done documentaries. You did a documentary about Bollywood that we, you know, you came up to Shetland to 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 introduce it. You've uh, done factual stuff and written about stuff. You've done loads of work on Elvis, and in the not too, you know, in the, in the fairly recent past, you've sat in on the film review show that Simon Mayer and I present when we go off. Well, we did, it's finishing, but when we go off, you stand in. So you've crossed from being a presenter to, if not being a critic on that show, being a presenter of a critical show. And I've always wondered how that feels. How does it feel to be somebody who is a practitioner stepping onto the other side of the line and inhabiting the, you know, at least putting your foot in the critic's role? It's very interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I was passionate about films um, from when I was a kid. And I know this has passed into folklore, but um, probably worth mentioning again that when I was about four or five years old, uh, an uncle uh, who came to the house said to me, well, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up, young man? And I said, uh, actor. And my dad said it's pronounced doctor. And um, which is which is true. It's that actually happened. So, you know, from five or six years old, I was really excited about everything to do with film. And so um, I was trying to think about why that was actually today. And I think everything about movies was escapism. And because, you know, we lived in a shop above a laundrette and we were an Indian family in West London. So every film that we had access to was escapism. It was not our world. You know, that was everything from you know, 1960s kitchen sink dramas to biblical epics to science fiction. Everything was was escapism and and everything was possible on that screen. Uh, whereas if I looked, you know, once that screen was was switched off or I was away from it, then those things, my life didn't look that possible. So, you know, in the end, in doing something like, you know, your fantastic show, which was, you know, I was a fan of, uh, first and remain primarily a fan. The opportunity to talk about films was something with people who are, who share that passion is an extraordinary gift. And you know, over the years, given you know our backgrounds and thinking about and having to very consciously think about who my tribe was, um, it only clarified when I met other creative people who were interested and had the same passions as me. Those were my tribe, not necessarily the people who had my cultural background or lived in the area that I lived in or had similar names or whatever. Um, the interesting thing about then being on on a on a film review show where there is criticism is something I remember talking to David Morrissey about, who'd also um, uh, presented the show, which was that you, you'd suddenly wary that you don't want to slag anyone off because they might just give you a job <laughs> in the future. But also for me, um, the, the appreciation of how much work goes into making a film by the number of departments it takes. It takes a video village to raise a film and it, all these different <laughs> departments. And it's it's really simple to slag a film off and go, I hate it. And suddenly you're lumping uh, innumerate skills at the same time by simply dismissing it. So even when I was presenting and I have when I have presented and there's a film I didn't particularly like, I was very conscious about saying at least one or two things about it that were good because, you know, whether it was the costumes, whether it was lighting, whether it was the production design, whether it was, you know, they did it on a minuscule budget, whatever it was that was worth celebrating in and amongst you know, a cacophony of awfulness, I would try to find that. And if I couldn't, then I just wouldn't say anything. So that that was, in terms of straddling that, it was sudden, suddenly understanding certainly what the actors go through, having, I hope, an appreciation of what every other department does, but also keeping in mind that every department that went to make that film couldn't be simply dismissed by kind of a, a glib one line kind of dismissal of of the entire film yeah mm. Mira you were nodding very enthusiastically when Sanjeev said you know you find that your people are fellow creatives not people who grew mm. up in the same area mm -mm. is that something that you feel strongly as well oh yeah we've we've talked about this a lot actually I mean I, I think we had probably had similar-ish experiences being sort of 
odd kid growing up, you know, didn't fit into what everybody thought we should be as first generation Asian kids. Um, Because, I mean, my parents actually didn't mind me going into the arts after I argued with them loudly. And when they realised that I fainted at the sight of blood and I wasn't going to be a doctor ever. (laughs) So they let me go my own way, which is very far sighted of them. But um, yeah, I mean... You know, one of the first things I did was think, well, I suppose I should join the India SOC because I'm already a really bad Indian because I'm doing English and drama and that's useless, isn't it? So I'll go and join the India SOC. And it was full of misogynists who were telling all the girls to hand around the samosas and boasting about, you know, how much money their fathers made. And I thought, you may be Indian, but I don't like you. <laughs> you're, not my, you're not my kind of tribe. You're not my tribe. Uh, where are the Indians that are like me? Hello, there must be some. And actually, I didn't really find that until I got to London and suddenly this whole world of all these people that were just like me that were the weird kids sniggering in the corner going does anyone else find this funny or am I the only one there they were Sandra was one of them the goodness goodness gracious me was like a coming home for me it was like I have shorthand I have cultural shorthand with these people you get me I wasn't mad we, we do all find the same things funny and it's a brand new culture that we're forming and we're going to form it together and how exciting. So, mm. yeah, for sure. That was an interesting lesson. <laughs> so where, when did you sort of going back again, when did you both, each of you sort of realise that that you were creative people? What was that? What was that through like early in life, whether it was a struggle or whether it was encouraged? What where where did you where did you start? Because you're both doing so much now. Um, who do you who who are you asking? I, well, uh, you go first, Sanj. <clears throat> um, well, for me, it, it's it seems really, to be quite honest, it was just based on a level of arrogance because um, I didn't. <laughs> and my mum says that when I was five, six years old, and we'd be watching TV, I would turn to her and say, "I could do better than that. I could do better than that." And um, <laughs> That was at five or six. And uh, and I said to my mum, I said, well, I was right. <laughs> so um, it was borne out. But I, I didn't do, I wasn't picked for plays at school uh, or productions or anything like that. I was um, for about four years running um, at that very young age, the nativity that we did every year. I was always cast as one of the three bloody wise men from the East. I, I'd exhausted <laughs> I, I think I was myrrh twice. I was gold <laughs> once. And frankincense. I mean, there are, there are only so many ways that you can present these bloody things uh, in a barn. And, um, and I complained about it uh, uh, to the teachers. I said, look, you know, I think I'm better than, you know, one of these. So it was always kind of Sanjeev, uh, Mahmud and Umbebe. You are cast as the... And it was kind of like, here we go. Um, and they responded by saying, uh, OK, but this year you're not going to be one of the wise men. Um, you will be head sheep. And it took me 10 years to kind of go, wait a minute. Um, so I didn't have any, any I, was, I was allowed to be at the front of the flock, basically. Uh, and so it, you know, from a very early age, I was kind of certainly interested and curious and stuff, but uh, the opportunities just didn't arise. And and because I then tried to be the good son and do what my parents wanted me to do, because I know how hard they struggled and how difficult it was for them to fit in. So I wanted to take, you know, some pressure off of that, uh, which I failed at miserably. So I was just very, very fortunate that by the age of, you know, the age of 34, I was able to kind of enter this the industry that I kind of had dreamt about since I was five. Mm. And Mira, just to sort of inflect that a little bit, you, on paper you've had the career that a lot of the students who'll be on this call would would dream of. Um, I mean, you, you know, you were encouraged to do the degree that you wanted to do, and then you went to Edinburgh, and then to the Royal Court, and then and you've, you you seem to have had lots of choices. I know it's not that simple, but um, you know how I, I guess there will be questions in the chat about how you got started, how any advice you could give about that. But and I, it was a very different cultural moment as well in the 1980s you know the arts weren't necessarily very well supported certainly not politically at that moment so how if you sort of remember yourself back to that moment how 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 
how encouraged did you feel to be part of that world? I know you've, you've, you've spoken about having to, you know, write your own roles, make your own roles and the, you know, the absence yeah. of any, anything out there that, that sort of looked like what you, how you saw yourself, as, you know, as being culturally and creatively. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I mean, I was, I mean, I suppose my, my big break was a one woman show that I developed at Manchester Uni, um, written by my friend Jackie Shapiro. We worked on it together. and. Um, ended up well I, I you know I had one of those sliding doors moments I actually wasn't going to go into this profession because even though I'd had four fantastic years at Manchester and I'd mainly actually TIE rather than was a big star of the department or anything I mean I wasn't I don't think I was considered one of the people who would make it whatever that meant but um, did really have fun and did loads of productions but I didn't see anybody like me out there I genuinely thought who's going to give me a job and what roles are there and where will I work? I mean, I just didn't know. I uh, didn't come from a family with any kind of connection to the business. So I had an MA place and a PGCE lined up, literally, and that's what I was going to do. I was going to do uh, drama and psychotherapy at Leeds and then my PGCE at Goldsmiths. I still think I've got the paperwork somewhere. I'm sure I could go back if I wanted. Um, and I was going to work with children with learning difficulties through drama because that was just opening out now it's quite common but there was only one course in the country that did it and I was interested in that and this one woman show from starting off at the National Student Drama well, firstly the Stephen Joseph studio at Manchester then got chosen for the National Student Drama Festival then went to Edinburgh they won some prizes and literally two weeks before I was due to start my MA uh, a director from the Royal Court saw the play and said do you want a job with joint stock for a year ending with a run at the Royal Court and I went um yeah I think I do mm, yeah actually. yeah um and I ran away to the circus but I often think gosh I, I wonder if someone was being very kind to me I was being handed this amazing bit of luck and my life could have gone in a completely different direction on the other hand it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't created the work yeah. so I guess that's sort of symbolic of how it's been in in my career I suppose and how it is for many people and particularly people for whom they're you know plowing a new furrow as I think we we both had to do is that you have to you know actors are the schmucks at the end of the phone waiting for someone to go like that it's not a job for a grown-up it's no good for your confidence or your soul you have to gain some independence and control over this uncontrollable and strange profession and one of the main ways you can do that is to create the work yourself and if you can't write then find a writer that will write for you then option books to turn into plays or films but just have that bit of your career where you have an eye on how am I seen am I in control of this narrative how do I want to be seen because when I looked I mean my first 10 years as an actor were all in the theatre and I was playing roles like a Peruvian millionaires and serious money, a, a deaf mutant in a 17th century village and birthright, most of them at the Royal Court. These incredible roles. So I, and then when it came to television, it was literally woman in news agent, woman in Raj, epic waving. Um, <laughs> you know, that would be it. And there was such this huge disparity between what was happening in the theatre, and this was the GLC was you know, very prominent then in London and was throwing money into the arts and suddenly an alternative comedy was coming up and suddenly people were thinking about Britain as a multicultural community uh, with many, many different voices who wanted to contribute. So it's a great time to hit the theatre, but film and television were like decades behind, decades. Mm. So I didn't so work on television for a long time or in film. So when goodness gracious me came along, I mean, as an audience member, it was it was an amazing moment. But what you know that that must have just been incredible and 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 so surprising that it had even happened, given what you know your experience before that. Well, I think Sam should take over that the journey to get goodness gracious me on was not a shoe in. It was a long long process, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, we had to jump through more hoops than anybody else. I mean, we came together. It was Mira who, who initially badgered uh, Anil Gupta, who was a producer, who's a producer of the show, but he was at the the BBC at the time, to telling him basically that you know we had enough material to have our own sketch show, and uh, he approached the BBC. He didn't think there were enough people, so he kind of saw myself and 
uh, Nitin Sawney, now a respected film composer and musician. Um, he, Nitin and I knew each other from uh, university and we'd started doing things as a double act. And uh, he came to see us. Um, the material we were doing seemed to fit the remit that they were thinking of in terms of modern British Asian humour. Um, I think it's probably, Nitin was involved in the radio series and then not the TV series, but I think it was him being involved that led to us having songs as an integral part of the show. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we were given, <clears throat> the team were, you know, actors were brought together and we were given six days to come up with a live show to uh, perform in front of an audience. And, um, and on the basis of that, they were going to decide whether, you know, to commission us for anything or not. So really, we had Monday to Friday and then the show on the Saturday, which we did. Uh, it, the audience responded very positively. We said, great, so can we have a TV series? And they said, well, no, you can have a, you can do a radio pilot. So we, then we did a radio pilot um, that did well, uh, went to Radio 4 as a series. So we said, now can we do, uh, can we have a TV series? And they said, no, no you can do a TV pilot. So we, then we did a TV pilot. <laughs> And then when we did the first series, they said, OK, great, we're going to put it on at um, Wednesday night at 11.30 p.m. And I said, well, you think that's Asian prime time or something? <laughs> I was a shop to shut. And then they kind of got annoyed about that and, um, and then put it on on a Friday at 9, uh, 9 o'clock or 9.30. Yeah, we really had to push for that slot, didn't we? We had to push for that A lot slot. of hoops. We, we had, with comparable sketch shows at the time, uh, we had just under half their budget for a weekly show. Um, so that meant that you know, we got paid less. It meant that, you know, production design had to be less. Um, so, you know, th those were the, we weren't aware of that uh, until later. Um, but it just kind of highlighted the fact that it was one more hoop we had to jump through, which was to do it on half the money. That, and I'm not saying this with any bitterness because we all did very well. We loved it. And the response was great. But just as an overview, those were mm. some of the challenges that were facing all of us. Mm. Can I ask you something about how much you use each other as quality control? Because, like, for example, you know, our lives are very different. You're fantastically successful and, you know, deservedly so. But like I write something like I write the Observer film column and then I immediately worry that it's terrible and it should never be printed. And the first thing I do is I have to sh I show it to Linda and I go, can you read this? I don't mean can you read it and uh, make it better necessarily, but can you just read it and tell me that it's not terrible and that they're uh, pick out the obvious mistakes? And I know there's a thing about a second set of eyes on anything, but there's also the second set of trusted eyes, the mm. second set of eyes, which is that's a quality filter. And if they don't think it absolutely sucks, then I might get away with it. Do you share that sense of quality filter with each other? Yes, I think so. And I think also there's a greater, um, you know, life lesson in that, which is that what we need in our lives are kind, uh, kind honesty. Um, you know, because it's, you know, I, you could, anybody can disagree with me. Everyone has the right to, and I am very likely to be misinformed, wrong, or have an incomplete thought. And, you know, there are two ways that somebody can point that out to me. They can either say, you know, you're an idiot, uh, or they can be nice about it. And so I think that practiced sense of sensitivity, but sticking to the honesty is kind of what we all need generally to move on. I mean, it, it's what you need with your kids. Um, because at any point, if they think that you're faking it, or they later discover that you faked it, um, they're not going to be, um, you know, that, that element of trust is then diminished. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, the quality control thing, I think when it comes to creativity, I think we do use and impart. Um, I'm certainly very conscious of that because, and I'm sure Mira is, because you know how much work has gone into it. You, you know, you are bearing a bit of your soul and, you know, any kind of rejection of what you've written uh, or the idea you've come up with is a bit of you. It's not some kind of, you know, it's not something that you whittled at the bottom of the garden from a bit <laughs> of bamboo. You know, it's it's something that's kind of at least in part come from you. And so it's 
and also to be entrusted with you know someone's self-worth is an incredible privilege and it's the last thing you want to it should ever even think about treading on you know so i think that extends from personal life into into work i think Mira? everything he said <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. No, I, I do. Um, Sanjay is, is is a very wise. He's he's the wise one in the house. Actually, I mean, I, I'm I'm always palming the children off onto him. Ask Ask Sanjay. He'll know. Just ask him. <laughs> it's very lazy of me, but he gives very good advice. I, I can, think that point. I... About, I think. That, sorry, very quickly. I think that point about anything you do is a bit of yourself. Even in your case, it's you know creating new works of art. In my case, it's criticism. In Linda's case, it's academia. And so what we're doing is responsive. But it's still, if you write a review of a film, you feel like that review is part of me. If you write a book about a film as the result, you feel that book is... But if you stand up in front of students and give a lecture, that is a part of you, even, you know, even if it doesn't immediately look like this is a work of art. Mm. That is how you feel about it, which I know sounds terribly pleading and, oh, please feel sorry for us, we're creative too. But it is, you know, I think it's that, true is, that, that is one, what it feels like. The one thing Absolutely. I would add to that, I think the one thing that I that was really useful for me coming into this industry late, uh, at a later age, was that I, you know, I'd come from business and marketing. And one of the things that I realized very early on, because auditions particularly are brutal things, because you go in there, you're one of, you know, next, and you're in. <laughs> Do your thing, do your little dance, and then they kind of go, right, we'll let you know, thanks very much. And then you never hear back. And you, you know, so it, it is kind of brutal. And it is, you go in there and you give of yourself. Um, the one thing that helped me actually was, given the background I came from, was realizing to everybody else I was a product. And so part of their judgment of me was not about my soul because they didn't know me. Um, they didn't have that kind of, um, they didn't have the time, but also they didn't have that privilege. And so what they were responding to was a product. And sometimes the product that was me just didn't fit into their marketplace. So I could come out of it with some semblance of who I was, because I've seen so many of you know fellow actors who have been decimated at not getting a job because they have kind of they've worked hard for it. They've learned the lines. They've immersed themselves in the world and they go in there. And it's the same as pitching a project. You can have you've written this screenplay. You've kind of, you know, tore your hair out. You've sleepless nights. You kind of like banged your head against a wall and you go in there and someone goes, nah, don't want it. And so, you know, it's it can be brutal, but it, mm. just keeping in mind that for other people, you are a product uh, as, was something that certainly helped me. I'm just uh, thinking that, that, that there'll be people in the audience here. We've got a really great drama department at Exeter. So, you know, my staff colleagues, but also the many students who come to Exeter to study drama, they, they've already got an inkling of that or they're moving towards that. I mean, that's a great thing for them to hear, I guess. But it is it is super brutal. I, I don't know why anyone would do it to themselves. I guess the rewards... When when you do get that call back, when you do get the yes, the rewards are are great. But does is there any sort of tie up between what you've been saying about creating your own opportunities and that? I mean, obviously, creating your own opportunities is one way of avoiding that awful stuff you just described. But um, <laughs> ha, you know, anything else you can say to the the kids who are you know in this call who are who are just terrified about that's where they got to go next and they've just got to toughen up for it. Mm. Well, you do have to develop a thick skin. That's that's absolutely true. Um, but I think it, I think to be a self-employed creative, you know, in many branches of the arts is it brings its own kind of brutality. But you know what? We we do it because we can't do anything else. I mean, no one should go into acting if they quite fancy it. They should <laughs> they should do it because there is nothing else they can possibly do or be because that's where their their heart is taking them. And in a way, you need to have that complete obsessive passion about it. That is the thing that keeps you going when the auditions don't fall right or, you know, when you've been six months without work and you're thinking, what, what else can I do? And it's a shame drama schools don't, 
sort of teach that as part of <laughs> the emotional resilience bit that you need to, to be uh, to be an actor. Um, but I think what Sanjeev said is really, it's hard as it is to, to, to try and not take the rejection personally and understand that I've been on the other side of the table, I've auditioned people for things. And I've seen some great actors, but sometimes it is just the way that somebody says a line or turns their head, which makes you as the writer go, oh my God, that's just how I saw that character. And it's nothing to do with the fact you've seen 50 other amazing actors that are all brilliant. There was just something that clicked chemically with how you saw that role. And actually, once you've been through the process on the other side of the table, it makes it much easier to bear when you get rejected. When you're on the other side of the table, I kind of understand that process now. But I do think that having some kind of autonomy and not just to be the helpless person, the passive person at the end of the phone is really important for your for your self-respect and for your mental health. I really do. Um, and whether that is that, you know, you get to go with an impro troupe every week and, you know, perform in a pub or whatever. I mean, keeping that the creative muscle is like any other muscle. It needs, you need to exercise it. Writing's the same. It gets flabby and you get more scared. So to keep that going is really important. Find like-minded people, build your community, hold each other up. You know, it is about kindness and support as well because somebody will really understand what you're going on is another, what's going on with you is another actor. I mean, we've been, benefited from all of those kind of connections when, and there have been lots of really hard times. It all looks great from the outside. But we could we could bore you with the rejections we had and the months of no work. I mean, it's been really hard sometimes. And I think we've both had periods. I know I have where I've gone, I can't tell if I can do this anymore. This is too hard. Mm. And the hardest thing, I think, to come to terms with is that you think it should be fair. It's not. Mm. You know, I know I can think of a dozen brilliantly talented actor friends I have that for some reason it just doesn't fall right for them and they don't work I can think of a few that I think have very little talent and seem to work all the time but that it, that it isn't if I work hard then I will get my reward and that's what you're taught as a kid aren't you it doesn't work yeah. that way I, yeah. I, I would just add to that that actually the two things actually three things that came into my head first of all it's having the faith that the last idea you had will not be the last idea you will ever have yeah. So, you know, the, the one thing is, you know, the, the ideas come, they get pitched, some get picked up, they don't, you move on. The other thing I know from uh, writer friends is sometimes that the idea is not picked up because it isn't the right time. Right time, totally. And so, uh, you know, I know that uh, Chris Lang, for instance, who, who writes Unforgotten, you know, he's got a drawer full of ideas that he had. And he, I remember him telling me that one of them then got picked up 10 years later. Because 10 years earlier, it just wasn't the right time for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all of those things suggest that uh, it's not about, you know, the mirror's right about the rewards to working hard thing. It's actually being resilient and playing the long game. It's absolutely a marathon. I still remember Ben Kingsley's response when uh, I think it was around the time of Gandhi that he won best newcomer at something. And it was, <laughs> you know, it's that, that old adage of 20 years to be an overnight sensation. You know, mm. it's, it's for me, I remember, I know actors um, who were my peers, uh, many of whom were, were very bitter that, um, that I hadn't struggled. They said, you know, goodness gracious me was your first thing and it worked. And I kind of said, no, I haven't struggled in the, in the way that you have. My struggle was wanting to do this for 25 years and not being able to do it. That was my struggle. Um, not that that uh, is a reason for success either, but absolutely, as Mira says, you know, if you're looking for some semblance, again, this is a, a you know, a, a life coachy thing as opposed to specific to this industry, um, is that if you look around for justice, you're just not going to see it because, you know, the people who deserve to be put down are you know succeeding in whatever terms that means and the ones who deserve it are not and the only thing you can do is focus on yourself and your mindset and as Mira said have kind people around you there's mm -hmm. nothing more important than that because the, the passion is the thing that sustains you the best bit of advice I heard before I started acting was from Richard Briers. Uh, the late Richard Briers, who was in The Good Life and um, 
many films in across the 60s and 70s and 80s. And I heard him on a on a radio show and somebody said to him, Richard, do you have any advice for young actors? And he said, yes, I do. He said, if you really want to act, if you really, really, really want to act, don't. He said, do it if you have to. And he's absolutely right, as Mira was saying, that you need that level of passion to work through the, the rejections and mm. the low points and the not getting work, etc. Can I just add very briefly to that, that I think that the other thing is, and I'm not saying this as a sort of, uh, you know, self-referential, don't listen to critics because critics aren't, no, no, seriously, because critics aren't reviewing films for people that make films. Critics mm. are reviewing films for themselves and their audience. They are not, mm. and the worst kind of films are films made with critics in mind and the best kind of films are made with absolutely no reference to them at all not least because as Mira said you know you said you, you know we could tell you stories of all the rejections we've had in the same way that if somebody writes a review with, that's broadly positive but there is one negative thing in it the only thing you hear is the negative thing because if somebody stands in front of you and says love your shoes great trousers brilliant jacket not crazy about the tie your hair's fab the only thing you hear is not crazy about the tie True. so don't because they're not they're not saying it for you and they don't know anything that you don't know and it won't help even if they praise you it won't help yeah actually interestingly in the theater there are there are some directors that ban reviews completely i think jamie lloyd is one of them and he he makes it a rule of the company said so we don't post reviews we don't talk about them we don't really take any notice of them we're here for the audience and for the company and enjoy the run so if you want to discuss a review or read it that's up to you but it won't be discussed in here also the other thing i just add to that is just um the for me the only bit of the work that's real is the doing it i've got no control over the edit I don't know whether my favourite scene stays in, whether my favourite performance stays in. Uh, it then gets edited. It then goes out to critics. I've got no control over what what critics are going to say. I've got no control over what audiences are going to say at all. I've got no control. The only control I have is the experience on set. And so I'm very comfortable with being in something that may end up being a commercial disaster and slagged off by everyone. But if I was happy during the making of that, that's my memory of it. Mm. And conversely, if if it's a terrible experience, hated the director, didn't get on with the other actors, it rained all the time, um, <laughs> was given a you know substandard Winnie Bago. Uh, <laughs> it was, and it turns out to be a huge success. My memory of it. I mean, you know, what's interesting to me uh, are things, you know, examples like um, Harrison Ford and Blade Runner. Now, Harrison Ford refused to talk about Blade Runner for decades. And I couldn't understand it because it's a film that I really, really love. And I think he's amazing in it. But his experience of it was not great. And it took him 20 years to be able to to sort of, you know, um, subdue that into something else. So you know, the, the actual getting together, you know, I find I find being on set and collaboration utterly magical. I I love the idea that you know the four of us could come up with something now that I could never have come up with on my own. And I think that magic is what I tap into in in collaboration, you know, whether it's kind of around a script or whether it's on set. It's I love walking around sets and seeing what production designers have done and what the costume people think it should be and how the lighting is going to be. I love it. I love it because they're all things I'm not great at and I would love to be able to do. So that whole sense of the experience being the most important thing and not being tied to the outcome, again, is something I think that has helped me kind of cope better mm. with the mm. undulations. Mm. Mm. The, the um, j Just a few minutes ago, you were talking about something being the right, the you know, or being a great creative um, sort of spark moment product not product yet but you know um uh entity but it hasn't yet found its moment and that happened with the kumars didn't it yeah yes it did yeah mm -hmm. um we would we was doing goodness gracious me on the radio and i had the idea for uh an indian family that um interviewed um celebrities in their home and every single um uh, 
person I took it to, Radio 4 initially, and then to Channel 4 and to production companies, all of them turned it down. They all kind of said, don't get it, don't understand it. How, do, how does a group of people interview one person? And they're all fake. And then in the meantime, we'd had characters like Ali G and Mrs. Merton. And I then repitched it and said, do you get it now? It's like Mrs. Merton's family or Ali G's family. And they went, yeah, but I don't get it. There's an old woman in it. And I, oh, okay. And um, <laughs> it was, it, so yeah, it was, it was five, five years, I think, five or six years before it, it uh, found its place and its time. So, uh, so yeah. And also because the thing that you worry about, if you feel that you've got a great idea and your friends say, this is a brilliant idea and you write it up and everyone says, no, you're scared that either someone will steal it or someone else will come up with the same idea that you had and usurp you in some way. Yeah. And that's what I meant about, you know, the last idea you had is not the last idea you'll ever have. If you had one great idea, you'll come up with another one. You know, it's letting that go and moving on to the next idea becomes what becomes part of your forward momentum because it's mm. really easy in the same way that the job you didn't get rattles around your head. And it's just a block for the next job you're going to get, you know, because you're still rooted in. I didn't get it. I'm a failure. It's unjust. And actually, those are all just obstacles to actually going. I'm looking forward. I'm ready for the next one. I'll learn off of it or whatever, you know. Mm. Can I ask you a question which um, came up a lot when I was doing the, the Calling the Shots project that, that Janice alluded to in the introduction? Um, how you how you just sort of manage the day to day of the I mean, we've talked quite a lot about the precarity of, of the industry, but, you know, how you you kind of mitigate against that. But it will require you to just go somewhere else on a location to just move at a very you know short notice and we're all people you know trying to navigate sort of sane family lives how do you how do you manage that between between the two of you in terms of the fact that you're both in the same industry you know a lot of people i interviewed they could sustain it if there was someone who could pick up the pieces so they could just go yeah it's been team tag parenting i think isn't it yeah Literally, we take it in turns and sometimes somebody gets a longer turn because you're on a roll. I had one of those years and Sam very nobly stepped back. I think we made the decision fairly early on that we try and always have one parent at home. Yeah. Um, there may have been an overlap of a week or two weeks maximum, but generally just as there's one person there because our son, well, he's 16 now, so probably just about... Is he just about leaveable at home? Probably. No. No. Nowhere near. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've worked it that way. And, you know, we both had to turn down jobs we really wanted to do because there was a clash, but it just was, you know, the other person's turn. So that's part of the that's part of the sacrifice. I mean, I I I have to be very clear about why I do a job and why I turn it down because um, that route is going to be my um, uh, my safety net. That's going to be my fallback. So I've done films where uh, I wanted to work with somebody. And if I if that's my you know clear decision, then I'm not going to be complaining about you know the, the trailer or how much money I'm getting or that I'm in the back of shot. It's not the reason I did it. I did it because I wanted to work with a particular director or a particular actor. And in the same way that if I've taken a job for the money, I'm not going to go around kind of quetching that it's not great art and <laughs> you know people should regard it as great. I didn't do that. I did it to pay the bills. And so equally, when I've turned jobs down, uh, when Mira's been working, it's because I wanted to be at home with the family. And again, you're going back to what I was saying about what's real in terms of the experience. If that project then becomes a huge success and turns stars into the people who are in it and they get lauded, it's fine. I knew I know why I turned it down. And so I, that has always been my fallback for either taking the job or or not taking it. Can I just mention, Sanj, you brought up the size of the trailer a couple of times now. And I know it's a, I know it's a joke. <laughs> But is there any part of it that's real? Is there any part of it is how big's the trailer? It's it's an interesting thing with the trailer thing. So it's um, I know that I remember talking to Mark Addy and he was talking about his experience on the Robin Hood film 
that Russell Crowe was in. And he said Russell Crowe had four trailers. Uh, that was part of his thing. And he said, and he put it in a square. So, you know, he had a <laughs> kitchen bit, he had a bedroom bit, he had a gym. And he said, uh, we all refer to it as Russell Square, which is a place <laughs> in London. So I kind of know that, um, you know, trailers can be a really big thing. I, I'm just so grateful to be doing something that I love because I, it's such a privilege to do something uh, that you're passionate about because 99% of the planet don't get to do that. They yeah. have to go out and work for a living. And so joking aside, the whole thing with the trailers thing is it doesn't bother me at all. If you've got great people around, you're not in your trailer anyway, you're hanging out with them and sharing stories and anecdotes and learning off them. And, you know, you know, everything you're doing is being poured into that experience, which is the thing that, you know, there's that great Maya Angelou quote that I use a lot at um, the University of Sussex, where I'm chancellor, um, which is that, you know, people may forget what you said, people may forget what you did, people will never forget the way you made them feel. And I think that's absolutely true on an interpersonal level, but also as an experience. So um, I've always been slightly scared about, you know, adding things to a rider of some kind because I just think is this the slippery slope you know if I kind of say can I have a couple of bananas I just think is that is that the slippery slope to kind of I want four trailers in a hexagonal shape I know there's only four but I still want a hexagon um I want to do the Mariah Carey one I think apparently she asked for a basket of poppies and kittens to pet before she went on Parkinson (laughs) I would love that a basket of poppies and kittens first time I went on the Parkinson show I said they said what would you like in your dressing room and I said well what have other people asked for and the the top one was puppies and kittens to stroke and (laughs) And then is the, this the, a real thing? Is this a real thing? That's, yeah, that's what I was told. That's what Where's I was told. the RSPCA in this? <laughs> and I, and they, and then the, the researcher who, who listed a number of people and what they'd asked for. Somebody had asked for a vintage bottle of red wine. Somebody had asked for organic fruit, and then obviously had saved this one to the end. And then said, "And what would you like?" I said, oh, just some "Coffee and some biscuits." <laughs> I didn't know what to say. So I've always been slightly nervous about that whole slippery slope from bananas to kind of your own jet pack or something so you can get to the set. <laughs> Could you say very quickly on this subject, I once asked the producer, Stephen Woolley, you know, is, is the trailers thing, you know, is it a joke? He said, the only story I can ever tell you is that the only person who ever ever asked to raise the trailer thing, and he said, I think it was reasonable. He said, when they were making Michael Collins, Alan Rickman was playing Eamon de Valera. And he said the night before he had to record the scene in which he basically gets up and delivers one of the most historically important addresses. He said, I know this sounds unreasonable. Can I have a big trailer the night before? Because I need to feel important. I need to to be able to step up. And Steve Woolley went, actually, that's perfectly reasonable. And Mm -hmm. they they organized it because he Mm -hmm. thought, okay, that was an artistic requirement. He needed to feel bigger than he was and that got him there i mean you can't help i have to say that you i mean i've, I've been on a couple of films with um, uh, with people who have got really kind of serious kind of seriously impressive trailers <laughs> and um colin farrell on a film who's lovely um it kind of invited me in to you know have a cup of tea and to sit and chat and all i could say <laughs> when i was in a in what is called a three-way which is kind of you know it's fine it's enough if you're in for a couple of days or something but it's 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 fairly small um and i just looked around it was just the sense of space mm. it was kind of this is you could have a band in it you could have an orchestra <laughs> in it. why haven't you got an orchestra you're important enough you could have demanded that there's a separate bedroom and everything isn't yeah. there there's a bedroom there's a proper shower oh it's love loves yes we, I've we only had one to, trailer like that. We really need to stop talking about trailers <laughs> now, guys, and get some questions from the audience, please. So I think my glamorous assistant, Will Higby, is going to make them magically pop in the meeting chat that I'm looking at now, but they're not there yet. Will? No, they're not have... there. They're, sorry, Linda, they're not there. It's going to be easier for us to kind of um, read, read out, them out. The questions, okay. if that's okay. Go so, for it. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the first question we've got is from D Rowe. Um, 
He says, hello to Jason Isaacs, everyone. I presume Sanjeev will get that. <laughs> uh, my question is, do you feel that cinemas will ever fully recover to pre-pandemic levels? And what do you feel will be the biggest challenges facing British filmmakers post-pandemic? Mira? <laughs> I think the two film experts should, uh, to, should answer that. Three film experts should answer that one first. Go on, film experts. Sanjeev, I think you should answer. Oh, flip a neck. Um, yeah, sorry. I think, I think it will recover. I think that cinema uh, has traditionally faced challenges from its inception and it evolves. And I think that, you know, whether it was films themselves at the beginning, the moving image and then sound and then television, uh, and so each colour, um, you know, um, all of those things, I think, you know, the industry felt impacted by. And I think that it's an interesting thing with streaming services, because um, with streaming services, you know, they have picked up and now uh, fund and distribute a lot of films that couldn't have been made in the traditional way. Um, I think that where film has always stepped up is to change the experience because that experience of going to the cinema in that darkened room with a huge screen with lots of people is something that is is kind of essential to that whole experience and so you know going back whether it was cinema scope or 3d or you know the movies tried to kind of adapt each time i'm not quite sure what the next adaptation will be i mean people are always already doing it with 4d sort of where you kind of experience kind of physical stuff, which used to be sense around in the 70s where they tried it. Earthquake was the big one that they said in sense around. It, just made, it was basically someone behind your seat just kind of shook it uh, every time Charlton Heston came on. And um, so I think I think it it will I think it will evolve. And I think that I hope that the the partnership between the streamers and, you know, distribution onto big screens will become more of a, a th you know, they've already started to show them in cinemas and stream at the same time. Um, personally, I'd like it to go back to, obviously, because I'm old, I'd like it to go back to it having an exclusive screening for a decent period of time before it appears on a small screen. But can, I, it, can I just say, Sand, that's yeah. not going to happen? No, it's I know not, it's not. No, I mean, it, it is just regardless of whether you want it or not, it's not going to happen. Simultaneous distribution is the future. Is and but I don't think that means that cinemas will, will, will suffer. I think that it means that cinemas that aren't offering an audience what they need will suffer. But in the end, it will be everyone will have the choice on release date to see things on their mobile phone or in the Empire Leicester Square. And it is the fact that people will still want to see things in a in a cinema even or even in a local art house cinema because you want to watch you know a, a, a small comedy with an audience that you can hear laughing it's a different experience i think we don't trust the audience enough i think if you give audiences the choice it doesn't mean cinema will die it and you know i think it will thrive but simultaneous distribution is coming it's like wednesday you can dislike it all you want it's coming <laughs> i think but that's that's what i mean i think it'll evolve and i think you know that cinemas now you know where you can uh drink where you can eat where you can you know there are other things you could do whereas when i was a kid you went to the cinema and there was the sweets and the popcorn and and that was about it now they're kind of meeting hubs and so i think all, any of those things that kind of reinforce or enhance or resell the idea of people getting together and being a community, I think is important for, for cinema and important for communities. Thank you guys, that was great. I did a lecture about this on Monday, by the way, that was all top notch. Trust the professor to mark us. <laughs> <laughs> Will, do we have more questions? Yeah, yeah, we, we have a few questions that have come through around, um, you know, advice that you would give to someone trying to start out in the industry, particularly with ambitions to write, and also from kind of a more direct question from Alex Hutchinson, who says, I was wondering how we as students are able to get our scripts seen. Thank you. Mm. What? Sorry, what was the question? The question was about advice for writers wanting to, uh, with ambitions to start out in the industry. What advice would you give to, 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 to new writers? Oh, did they specify whether it was screen, stage, novel? Uh, screen. Screen. Um, 
Gosh, well, I suppose I've, that's the one I've got least experience in in terms of having to start out because um, I was very lucky that I got my first commission off the back of somebody reading my prose um, and then said, I, I like the way you write, but can you write for screen? And then I I got I got in that way. Um, I mean, it's changed so much now, isn't it? I think what is very heartening is that because of technology, writers now have the means of production to actually put things on even if nobody else wants to. <laughs> so I know a lot of um, young screenwriters coming up who are starting off with a short film, which seems to be the calling card and the best way to get onto the festival circuit. And they're literally crewing it and shooting it themselves on shoestring budgets. That's if you want to go full radical, I'm taking the means of production into my own hands. Um, but in the end, if you want to write for screen, it is fantastic for anyone that wants to hire you to see your work rather than read it on a page. So I would certainly say that is the way to go as a calling card for any screenwriter. Can I just add to that? I think that one, what, for any part of uh, uh, this industry, it's really useful, I think, to know how the industry works. So just to know what path your script takes you know the, the the cycles that it goes through to its end product you know it's you know there's a burning desire when i think if you've written a screenplay to you because as you're writing it you're, you're seeing the finished product in your head um that's how you're writing it and so knowing that these things take time and there are kind of uh, various stages it, to to go through is really useful to know and i think mira's right i mean i've kind of judged uh um, short film competitions and I judged one which were I think they were one minute films shot on iPhones and the level of storytelling was extraordinary I mean the couple of things that won I thought had as much depth and power to them as a kind of 90 minute film could and so uh, Mira's right you know be, to be able to show that is a much quicker uh, and clearer calling card particularly for a screenplay than handing over, you know, page of writing. Thank you. Uh, Will, any more? Yep, we have one. Um, how far do you think the ground has changed in terms of access and diversity in film and TV compared to when you broke through with Goodness Gracious Me in, in the, the late 90s? Wow, I mean... <laughs> not, not far enough, <laughs> patently. Uh... You know, I mean, when you, we compare how it was when we started and the kind of stuff we were surrounded with, then at least you look backwards and go, of course, there's been progress. Um, it never seems fast enough when you're in it. Um, I mean, I think, I suppose I worry about cosmetic change, which I think is sometimes happening, which is that let's... Um, Let's use the analogy of somebody trying to diversify their, their plush West End offices. Let's put all the black people on the reception desk and everyone from management up are white. And that's known as set dressing, really. And that there is a danger of people wanting to thinking that they've righted the imbalance that's been on going on for a long time. Um, by doing that, it's not just about the faces that you see if you're, we're going to get real diverse change, actually, it has to be on every level of crew. It's still so rare when I walk into a set that I see people, diversity reflected in, in the makeup of the crew, in the makeup room, the, the grips, the sparks, whatever. Still rare. Um, obviously, writers, because writers bring a, a diverse perspective in their writing, and they will write those characters that you want to see on screen, the way you cast things management level, commissioners, because it's really hard to explain an idea to someone that might not ever have diversity in their own life and how are they actually going to understand a, a script that deals with that. So we've made great strides. I don't want to be pessimistic, um, but I think we have to not pat ourselves on the back too quickly because it's not just about how many faces are on screen. It is the whole top to bottom. I think that's right. I think that for me, diversity has always meant far more than uh, gender or uh, race. It's also about age. I think in this country, in Britain, it's also about uh, regional voices. And I think until and class, class obviously, increasingly, actually, um, is 
is kind of, you know, it, until we kind of regard those stories, uh, all of those stories as ours, we always regard them as someone else's. They're the other. It's a chick flick. You know, it's a, it was interesting. The Kamars uh, was described as a British comedy everywhere in the world except Britain, um, <laughs> which is which is an interesting thing. But, you know, they kind of looked yeah. at it and compared it with other British comedies they'd seen and went, yeah, it's part of that. Um, it's only in Britain that it was an Asian comedy and it was kind of uh, uh, pigeonholed that way. So it, I think that in terms of, you know, what's good is that it, this seems to because the conversations uh, are more overt than they were maybe a couple of two, three decades ago, um, you know, there are stronger, certainly on television and to a certain extent in film as well. There are stronger, um, you know, female leads, female leads of color in films, films that are getting recognition and prominence. I think the other big difference is that kids now compared to certainly when I was a kid have access to foreign language films uh, a lot more you know suddenly the, you know watching Parasite um, you know our kid you know didn't regard it as someone else's story because he got into the story because it's good storytelling mm -hmm. and that's the great kind of misnomer about um, about um, subtitle films is that it's going to be somehow you're not going to be able to relate to it in some way if it's good storytelling you will and and that chips away at your subconscious in terms of what you know your stories are so mm. in that sense I think there is there is definitely progress from when I was a kid because on television you very rarely got uh, um, uh, foreign language films that were ac accessible at all now they, they break through and they're a bit more kind of focused upon but so I think there's definitely advantage Sorry, what I was going to say, you just made me think when you said par um, Parasite, is what's really interesting is what we've, the streamers have really opened up the way that we tell stories. I mean, they gave terrestrial channels a kick up the arse in this country, which were looking increasingly fusty and old fashioned. And we are part of a global village. We're sharing now stories all the time. And what's really interesting is the more specific you get in your story about the culture or the world you come from, the more universal the message becomes and I don't know why that is but I think the more the deeper you go into a really authentic felt voice that hasn't been heard before somehow it reaches more people and I think it's because it comes from a place of truth and because it comes of a place of the dispossessed who haven't been able to speak for so long going oh here it is and it and I think you know goodness gracious me had that weirdly when when you haven't had the chance to speak for so long or you're just finding a new voice then when you speak people really want to listen and that I find very heartening and I think the stories that seem to be catching people's imagination and bringing us all together are the ones that are coming from really different and diverse places in society and I find that very heartening it makes me think that we're all looking for that connection and we want to feel the authenticity of the experience. I think I think with any film actually the the uh authenticity generally comes from the specificity yeah you know it comes from something very small and specific as opposed to a broad brush stroke um because then you know it just washes over you and it's generalized and it's it's not bespoke in the way that a specific emotion uh, or a particular word in a particular scene can be i'm really impressed you said authenticity and specificity really close to each it other wasn't easy. <laughs> it, it wasn't easy I, I was concentrating for about 10 You're minutes before you. i said it <laughs> <laughs> but brilliantly done both of you thank you so much we are going to have to stop um because we've got to the end of our time oh. i know that will wants to do a vote of thanks which would be great um but but thank you from me um just fantastic discussion Re really brilliant and thanks mark upstairs you you were pretty good as well so uh can i hand over to will please yeah, so just as we come to the end of the of, of the event, it's really my pleasure on behalf of the College of Humanities and University of Exeter to, to offer an official vote of thanks to Mira and Sanjeev for participating in, in this evening's creative dialogue. I think really sincere thanks, Mira and Sanjeev, for sharing insights into the creative process. That was really fascinating. Wise advice coming from Sanjeev for those aspiring actors and writers some hilarious anecdotes as well as now I have a detailed understanding I think of the hierarchy of trailer envy that goes on on film sets um, you know, across the world and I think also thanks for reminding us through the extended conversation with Mark and Linda really of the importance of your contribution to um, you know the cultural landscape of the UK as writers and performers I think to me your work always feels generous and inclusive 
even and, and especially when it's moving the dial and challenging the stay predictable and parochial ways of thinking about the society we live in and the kind of community that we we want to be. So thank you very much for, 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 for finding the time. I know it was an epic tale to get us to a date that everyone could make, but we really do appreciate that. Appreciate your time. It's been no, I appreciate that, event. Will. And, and also, you know, um, thank you to the holographic cyborg uh, over your right shoulder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Stays in and out. There you yeah. go. But, you know. <laughs> um, I think also the, the other thing I'd like to say is, you know, every successful dialogue needs to two parties or in this case two couples and so thanks are also due to Mark and Linda for for guiding us through the conversation yeah, so skillfully and creating a really com convivial atmosphere for this evening's event I think you know despite the fact that we're all still in boxes on teams it's been a really really warm mm -hmm. and, and 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 sort of convivial um discussion um thanks also to the staff um at Exeter who worked really hard to bring the evening together and to make it a success and also thanks to the audience um for joining us online providing great questions and um you know being part of this i think the only regret we've got at the end of the event is that we couldn't welcome mira and sanjeev to exeter in person um but hopefully as we navigate a way out of the pandemic and into our new normal of still not knowing exactly who wants us to wear a mask and who definitely wants us to take them off, I, I hope that we'll be able to welcome Mira and Sanjeev to Exeter in, in the not too distant future. So so real sincere thanks, Mira and Sanjeev. Mark and Linda, thanks for for, for, for being great um, interrogators of, of the kind of um, the sort of like the, all of the issues we're looking at. And and um, to the audience, thanks for being here. And we hope to see you again um, in the summer term, maybe sometime in May for the next event in the Cultural uh, Creative Dialogue series. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks a lot. See you.